It makes it good because when you can when you can sing a praise, when you can sing what God's done. Have you ever been like just going down the road, you know, one day just going and you're just driving because you've had a lot of stuff on your mind, you've had a lot of stuff on your heart. And next thing you know, you just break out into, it ain't a song nobody's ever heard because you're just making it up, you know. It's it's one of those that's just, you know, God, I, <clears throat> I just can't take it anymore, you know, as I'm driving by the store. Lord, I feel I'm such a bore, you know, just whatever you can do, you know. You're just making it up, but you're just worshiping and you're praising God. Just asking for something, you know. God, I just need something. I just want to worship. I just want to praise. And when you get these messages, oh, it just makes it so good. And I got to thinking about that song. We was talking <clears throat> Wednesday night about, about doing this. The psalmist says this because when you think about what the song says, the splendor of a king, you know, clothed in majesty. And it talks about how he's all the earth rejoice. Listen to what psalm, the psalmist tells us way back in 47.7. Uh, it says, For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with the understanding. I'm here to tell you, folks, when you can sing that song, how great is our God. And you understand it. You know, it is one thing. You ever had homework? I tell you what, you get some classes in school, and it just gets to the point where it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter what's going on. I just don't understand it. But to order, in order to pass, okay, you've got to be able to complete it. Math, chemistry, that kind of stuff, where you get all these equations. You don't understand it, but you know how to plug in the right numbers, and you know how to make the equation work out. But you don't understand it, but you still get the passing grade. And all of a sudden, one day, you're sitting there working on one of these problems, and the little light bulb goes on. It's like, click. I understand it. When you understand something, ain't it so much sweeter? Ain't it so much better? Because now it all makes sense to you. When you can truly understand how great God is, that when you sing about it, you can feel His presence. You can feel the anointing. Or when you're just talking about it, you can feel God's Spirit dwelling and bubbling, bubbling up within you. When you can feel, when you understand the relationship that God wants to have with you, oh, it is so much better. Listen to what the, uh, the psalmist says here. The Lord reigneth. He's clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he has girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Oh, thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice, and the floods lift up thy waves. In Revelations, it talks about how the sound of the praise went up like rushing waters. Have y'all ever been to a waterfall to where you just can't hear nothing? I went to Niagara Falls. Of course, I went in late February, and it was all froze over. You know, where you went, it was froze. You couldn't get down close enough to it because everything was closed. But the sound of all of that water rushing over, you can't hear anything but the water. <clears throat> Can you just imagine how, how much praise will be sung, how much praise will be going up because how it describes it, that the praise come out like the rushing water. The sound that just overwhelmed because everybody just wants to praise God, just wants to praise Him for His creation, praise Him for what He's done. And the Bible tells us if we, His people, won't praise Him, that He will call upon the rocks. He might call upon the waters. He will call upon his other creations to praise him. We've got to have the understanding. If we want to be blessed, we, can, we cannot stand or we cannot put ourselves in a spot where we're not standing with Christ. But we've got to be able to stand, to worship, to praise, to lift up, to recognize who he is. As this song was saying in Psalms 104, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment. Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. We can look up and we can see as the heavens come across us. Look up and when you see these pretty you know, blue skies before the storms roll in. But you see the beautiful blue skies 
And then you see the, the cloud formations as they start to come in. Who all likes to look up and say, oh, look, there's Pluto. You know, you see, uh, the, I'm talking Pluto as in like the, you know, Disney dog. Or you see the cloud make another formation. We used to have one, and we'd always look as a kid looking, look, look, there's Godzilla, you know, coming over here to get us or whatever. You look up in the clouds and you see these shapes, a puppy or whatever, and you just think and imagine <clears throat> even the clouds, you know, are changing, but they're doing something as God is over there looking. He's changing the scene for us. Y'all look up right now. Y'all see this ceiling? <clears throat> Y'all can look up all you want until it falls in on your head. This is the way this ceiling is going to look until it goes. But when you go outside, God's grace, God's beauty, it changes daily. As He changes it, as He, as he covers Himself, the Bible says, over the, His creation, it changes daily and we can look and magnify and glorify just how great God is that he can just change the landscape, change everything about it. It says, uh, honor and majesty, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Now we look at this as this is our sanctuary. This is the place in which we come to worship. This is the place in which we come to, to bow before him or to gather together in, in fellowship. And it says that strength and beauty. Do you feel strong for God? Do you feel beautiful for God? And I'm asking you this because, you know, we all know that God don't look on the inside. Or God don't look on the outside. But God looks on the inside. You can be the most muscular person, as Paul used to say, you know, talking about. He says, hey, it doesn't necessarily do so much for you to get your body in such a great, strong shape. But how is your spirit? Amen. How is your fellowship? How is your relationship with God? You can have all the outward adornment beauty that you want, but if the spirit within, if the soul within has the blemishes, has the ugliness, has the filth about it, then we're not as we should be to God. So we as his people have to have that inner strength, that relationship, that fellowship, and we have to have that inner beauty, the one that's not looking to be adorned for us, the one that's not looking to lift us up, but one that points towards Him, but one that adores Him and one that lifts up His name. Why? Because He is God. And the world itself trembles at God's creation. Remember when it, it says He was crucified on that cross? And it says that uh, the, the earth shook, everything went dark, the veil was rent in twain. When Jesus and God is on the scene, the earth itself will move because he is the creator. The Bible says he looketh upon the earth and it trembled. He toucheth the hills and they smoke. The earth gives praise and credit to the one who created because it understands that he is the creator. Do we understand who our creator is? i tell you who else understands who the creator is, and that's Satan himself. Spent lots of time with, with God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost up in heaven before he decided, I think, I'm, I think I can do this my way. And next thing you know, Satan and a third were cast out. <clears throat> but even they have to tremble, for they know who he is. Mark 5 and 7 says, And cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou tormentest. Me not. Jesus comes walking up and right away the demons recognize who he is. As he walks up, the demons start to tremble. As he walked up, the demons start to fear. And right away it's Jesus, have mercy upon me. I know who you are. I know what you can do. <clears throat> I know what you're capable of. Torment me not. Do not send me back to the place where I'm supposed to be. Do not send me away, God. Do not torment me. Then in another case, in Luke 4, it says, The devils came out crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And then he rebuked them and suffered them not to speak. Oh, folks, let me tell you something. When Jesus gets on the scene, it doesn't matter if Satan has been there for two minutes or for 20 years. When Jesus gets on the scene, Satan starts to tremble because he knows who the great king of kings is. He knows who, how great and mighty our God is. He understands because he's seen it. He might not like them, but he bows in reverence. He might not want to stick around, but he has to know who he is subject to. And God tells us, he said, not only 
Am I over the Satan these things? But I have given you the power and the authority over them as well. So, folks, guess what? <clears throat> when we come walking in the room and Satan is sitting there snarling and you're having issues in your life, you just remember this. If there's enough of God in you, then guess what? Satan just starts to tremble. And if there's enough of the Creator within you, Satan has to step back and let God walk in front. <clears throat> Don't be like one of the seven sons of Seth, though. Y'all remember those boys that, oh, here we are. Our daddy's the prophet. Our daddy's the priest. And they come in and find this old man, got all these demons in him, sets them down. They said, it's time for you to, time for you demons to be gone. Old demon looks up and says, hmm. He says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? The Bible says they, he picked them up, whipped them, sent them out the house naked, running down the street. Folks, if we've got God within us, we've no reason to be scared. If we've got God within us, we've got no reason to have to worry about what Satan tries to put on us because even Satan and his devils tremble where God, when God comes on the scene. He trembles, they shake because our God is a great, powerful, and a mighty God. The song says also, it says, He's a Godhead three in one. Oh, I like that. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. And we believe in God the Holy Ghost. Now we also believe that each one of them is still alive. And that each one of them is still doing their parts. And let me read you these scriptures right here just to let you know that the Bible also believes in the God three in one. For there are three in 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And in Matthew, Jesus tells us, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Folks, if you don't believe that God is a trinity, that God is a three head, then you're not believing what the Bible says. If you don't, not, let me make sure I get that right. Somebody says, oh, he's a three headed. No, I'm not three headed, but he's part of a three head trinity. If you don't believe then you need to read the Word of God. We've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And I believe you can look back in Genesis when it says that, it says, and God looked upon the earth, and it says he looked at man and he formed him in our image, is what the Bible says. More than just one, we believe in that once Jesus came down, and once he was crucified and resurrected, as Jesus himself said, I'm going to send you another. I'm going to send you the Comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost who will bring you through. He will give you what you need to make it to the end of times. We believe in that Godhead, the three in one. Then the Bible says, or then the song talks about how he's aged, ageless. He's timeless. He's the beginning and the end. Psalms tells us this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, that thou art God. From before the world was even formed, God, you was already there. Before the first mountain rose up out, God, you were already there. Before the first waters hit, God, you were already there. It says you're ageless. For a thousand years in thy sight, are but a yesterday. When it is past and you watch in the night. A thousand years is as a day. Can you just imagine that? A thousand years. You know, heck, we have enough hard enough time saying, oops, 30 minutes is up, gotta get out of church. Can't say this no more. Imagine this, when you get to heaven, you know, the Bible says, oh, I've been there just today. Well, really, it's been a thousand years. Can you just imagine that? Or well, you're sitting there thinking, oh, it's just, it's been, how long have we been here? Oh, just a day. Time doesn't matter to a God who is forever and ever and ever. He's always been and he's always going to be. And here's the good part. If we trust and believe in him, then guess what? We're going to be there with him forever as well. John tells us this, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made, made. And in Him was life, and the light of men. 
Paul tells Timothy, he says, Now unto thee, King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. When Jesus come down, folks, he didn't give up any of, of his divineness. He didn't give up any of his heavenly citizenship. <clears throat> but he came down, and the Bible says he took the form, the shape of man, and then it says he went through his life 33 and a half years and he preached and he taught. And then he became the crucifixion. He became that lamb. He became that sacrifice that it was going to take for each one of us to make heaven our home. And because he become this way, we can now have fellowship with God. But it had to be through that. And the Bible tells us this. It says in Isaiah, it says, For a child will be born unto us, a son will will be given unto us. And the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. Imagine this, Jesus and God and the Holy Ghost up there talking. And we've been around here forever. we got this whole world created, but man just can't seem to get it right. They just keep falling. They just keep stumbling. And Jesus says, Dad, you know, if, if you could just... If we could just get me on down there and get this plan underway, that we can one more time have fellowship with man. That then those who want to praise, then those who want to worship can have a way back to you. And he comes down. Now here he is, a king. Here he is, the Lion of Judah who becomes the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. And it says in John 1 and 29, it says, the next day Jesus, or the next day, excuse me, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming into him. And he said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Here's Jesus coming in, going to be the Messiah, going to be the deliverer. And right away, what does John recognize him as? The Lamb of God. The sacrifice. That even though he's the king, even though he's powerful, even though he's been there forever, he's the sacrifice. The one that God had told him about. The one that God had anointed him to preach about to make heaven to be his home. And then Revelation tells us this. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The lion and the lamb. The king yet come down to sacrifice. The king, the one of the, one of the Godhead, one of the Trinity, yet come down to give it all so that we could have a way back to the throne. And in the book of John, in the gospel of John, Jesus is he's getting ready to come riding in for his trial for entry into you know, Palm Sunday going before Easter. And the scripture says, For fear not, daughter of Zion, behold the king cometh, and he's sitting on a donkey's coat. Can you imagine that? Here's Jesus making his last ride into Jerusalem, knowing that he's the king, knowing that he's fixing to be not only the, the lion that he is, but he's fixing to become the lamb, yet he still rides in, knowing what's in front of him. And the Bible tells us in Revelation, as John the Revelator says, it says he's ticking up in his spirit, and he's standing, and he's seeing all of these things that's being poured out. He's saying all the, all the trials, all the tribulation, all the vials, everything is being, being poured out before him. And all John can think of is, wow, here we are, us, us humans, here we are, and, and there's no way to make it. And it says that he looks, and there's a book, and there's a book that's in the midst, and he says, who can open this book? So they look to him and they say, well, don't worry. There is one that can open it, and he is the Lamb of Judah. John goes on. He sees Jesus again. 
But he don't see the Jesus that, that he knew when he was on this earth. But it says he finally sees Jesus as the true king. And in Revelation 17, he says, They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And out of the mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And it says, and he, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How great is our God? How great is our God? He's great enough to come down to this earth to overcome death, to rise up, and to take his place back at the throne. How great is our God? Our God is great enough to come to a son of a carpenter, to a, to, a, to a young, how shall we say, poor young couple to be born into this world, to become a lamb, to become a sacrifice. But yet, as he also was that lamb, he was also still his, his Godhead, still his Trinity. He was also part of the Almighty and the powerful. He was also God in the flesh. He was God in the Word. How powerful is our God? Able to overcome every obstacle, every step he took. Every word, the praise that come out was to lift up God. Every sick person that come up, the Bible said that he would heal. Every person that come up with the demons, with the uh, whatever was going on in their life, he was able to touch. He was able to deliver. How great is our God? He that opened and created this universe. He that every day through every situation that we go through, we can look back through the scriptures and we can see where he has prepared the way for not only those that have gone before us, but for those that will continue to go from us and through us and down the line. How great is our God? You know how great our God really is? <clears throat> it's how great, well, I'll put this one. Let me change that around. Our God is greater than we can imagine. But here's the thing. You ever heard that old saying, how close are you to God? How is your relationship with God? How great is God to you? And I'll say this. The answer is as close as you want to be and as great as you want Him to be. Because think about it. There's no limits to God. There's no limits to anything that God can do and God will do. But it's us that gives the limitations. How great is our God? How God... How, how great can you be to me? Well, let me say, I'm going to put a little, I'm going to put you back in the box, and I'm going to say you can only be this great. I'm going to say you can only be this good. Well, when we limit God, we're also cutting our own nose. What's that? Cut your nose off to spite your face. When you start limiting God on His greatness, when you start limiting God on His power, folks, you're not doing nothing but hurting you. Now, you're going to hurt the kingdom, but God will raise up somebody else for the kingdom. But you're only hurting yourself and your relationship with Him. Don't start thinking that God's not good enough or God's not big enough. Look around you and see what He did. Look around you and see what He does. <clears throat> God is plenty <clears throat> great enough. Just ask Joseph. Here's Joseph. Born and all of his brothers are sitting there. They all turn their back on him. They turn against him because God has shown him through dreams that he's going to be somebody in God's kingdom one day. And God has showed Joseph that he's a man that was chosen. And here's Joseph thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, <clears throat> falsely accused. And next thing you know, Joseph is sitting second in command in Pharaoh, the one that God is using to heal his land and to heal his people and to save them from a famine. How great is, is your God? Just ask Joseph what he would say. He would say, God is great enough to take me from death's door to the top of the power chain to where I need to be. God is great enough for me. Moses, how great is God to you? Well, God was great enough to me to save me as a baby in the bulrush and I floated down and I went right back 
to Pharaoh's courts. I was raised as a king among the men. I was brought up and I was trained and I was highly educated. I didn't have to work in the brick pits. I didn't have to be where everybody else was because God was great to me and God was using me. And then God used that same education to take me right back into the same people with her once raised me up to be able to set his people free. And when I was in the wilderness, God was great enough to lead me on, to lead me to people, to split the Red Sea, to provide water from a rock, to provide food on the ground. God is great enough for me. Why, Joshua and Caleb, how great is God to you? God was great enough that when we went into the other country, when we went into Canaan land, that we didn't look at the people that was there, the giants, but we looked at what God had promised for us, and we were able to march on. And when it come time, Caleb, even though I was 80-something years old, to take that mountain, I knew that God had given me the same strength that he had when I was a young man, but when you be what Caleb told you, and I was able to take the mountain because my God was great enough to provide and to overcome. Samson, how great is God to you? Well, I can tell you how great he was to me that even though I failed him, even though many times I fought the Philistines, even though many times I fought the enemies of God, I failed God one day, <clears throat> but God was still great enough to allow my covenant, to allow my hair to grow back, to allow me to one more time to be able to see, even though the enemy had burned my eyes out. He was good enough to me, a great enough God, one more time to give me my strength that I could fight one more battle in my life <clears throat> and in one more swift push able to destroy the enemies that had set before me that had caused me to be captive. I was able to whip them because greater is the God that I serve than the Philistines and the enemies of this world. Gideon, how great was God to you? Oh, God had provided me many, many men. God had provided an army, but God also kept telling me, don't bring it upon yourself. Don't think about it that it's going to be of you. All you need are 300 men to go out and do battle. Therefore, God can be praised. And Gideon says with the 300 men that God gave me, that victory was won in every situation. That's how great God is to me. Why, Daniel, <clears throat> didn't you have to spend the night in the lion's den? I sure did, but my God is great enough to where the lion that he created from the beginning of, <clears throat> of this world when he created those animals, that that lion knew that I was a child of God. It didn't try to bite. It didn't try to snip. It let me lay on it as a big old pillar all night long. My God is great enough to deliver. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How great is your God? Well, my God is great enough to take me through the fiery furnace to burn the ropes that bound me off, but now where I could come out and not even smell like smoke. That's how great my God is. Even though I'm in the pit, even though I'm in the fire, I'm not touched, I'm not hurt. My God created it all, therefore I don't have to worry about Nehemiah. How great is your God? Well, my God is great enough to send me back to, the, to uh, Jerusalem to be able to build the temple. And even though I had everybody against me, even though we had to build the walls with somebody with a spear and a sword and somebody sitting there praying and somebody working, my God is great enough to accomplish every need that is worked if we will just trust in him and we can rebuild the city that had faltered. Peter, how great is your God? Oh, my God is great. <clears throat> so many times I'd stick my foot in my mouth. So many times I would say something dumb. So many times I would jump off the on the wrong foot and go do something. But my God was great enough to forgive me and to use me. My God was great enough that when I'm walking on the water in the storm, that even though I took my eyes off, he forgave me and reached down and pulled me back up. How great is my God? My God is great enough to where I can't even be put to death the same way <clears throat> to me it would have been a... a, a, a a shame, so I just had them to crucify me upside down. That's how great my God is. I would go to the cross for him. Paul, how great is your God? 
Paul said, my God is great enough to where even though I was a chief among the sinners, even though I had Christians put to death, even though I was once one that, that all I did was come against God, that he brought me to my knees, that he set me back in a place to where I was once more humbled, to where I can once more look up to see him, even though my eyes were blinded, my spiritual eyes were open, and I could once in my life see just how great God is, and he set me up once a man that Christians or that Jews feared, now as a man that can spread the gospel and go through all of Europe carrying God's word as the biggest a revival is going and that God was using me to spread his word. That's how great God is able to conquer any, any fear that man has. Anything that, that man can put in front, God would tear down. That's how great God is. Lazarus, <clears throat> how great is your God? Lazarus says, oh, I, my God is really great. I used to walk with him. I used to talk with him. <clears throat> we used to go eat dinner on Sunday nights. We used to eat dinner, sit down and cook fish. But one day he wasn't there. One day he was off ministering over here and I got sick. And I got sicker and sicker. And my sisters would send for him. But finally death took over. And I died and, and I was in a tomb. But the next thing I remember, I heard a voice. One that I had heard year after year. One that I had heard day after day. One that I had heard say, pass the salt over here. One that I had heard say, hey, give me this. One that I had said, Lazarus, come over here. And I heard that same voice. You want to know how great my God is? That even the sound of his voice calling my name broke the grip that death had upon me. Broke open the ties that where Satan was or where death was trying to.